Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I was just told that there were snacks being served outside, so it's. We'll see how this talk goes. I'm optimistic. Um, my name is Deepak Bhatia. I'm the vice president of an organization called SCOT, or Supply Chain Optimization Technologies at Amazon. And my uh, colleague who will be joining me for this talk. His name is Salal Homer, who's a distinguished scientist and a VP in the same organization. Um, the talk, I think, is going to largely talk about the journey of how we uh, automated, uh, or in some sense, uh, built one of the largest automated decision-making systems in the world, if not the largest. I don't think I can uh, make that claim, or I would like to make that claim. but. Uh, but a pretty big deal in terms of the decisions for the Amazon consumer business or the Amazon stores business, both on the retail side of things and on the 3P uh, third party selling or what we call fulfilled by Amazon. And we'll talk about um, how we push the boundaries in terms of creating capabilities to uh, deliver products in two hours uh, or potentially less in the future, in a network that is increasing in complexity, um, you know, at a pretty fast pace, both in terms of the size of the network, uh, nodes uh, doubled in last, you know, three to five years. So that's the kind of uh, network complexity and um, growth that we have to deal. Our systems have to basically be. Uh, have to pass the test of time. So, uh, I'll talk briefly about what is SCOT, and we'll talk about, since I said this is a story, this is about a journey we took, and in some sense we are still going through, and probably will continue to go through this journey. But as you get far along in a journey, uh, earlier phases, they become clearer to you. So we can call them phase one, phase two, and phase three is kind of ongoing. And as I said, as we progress more into it, maybe it will become more apparent that that was phase three. But Salal is going to talk about phase three. I'm going to talk about the earlier phases on uh, how we automated, how we brought large-scale optimization uh, into supply chain decision making and how it morphed into a um, project that was literally called hands off the wheel, for the lack of a better word. It's kind of become a bit of a cliche, but that's what it was called six, seven years back. Um, and how it morphed into uh, not just making decisions, uh, but also, in some sense, running the business with technology and being accountable for those decisions, directly accountable. Uh, unlike, I would say, um, a purely technology team that has a platform kind of a service, they may be a bit further removed from the business outcomes, unlike in our world where uh, we have direct kind of accountability for uh, business outcomes, whether it's customer experience or a bunch of other key performance indicators or metrics that you can think of. So uh, what is SCOT? Well, it's kind of there on this slide. Uh, we build and operate automated systems to maximize customer satisfaction while minimizing supply chain costs. I think that's kind of obvious, but the way to kind of think about the way it's structured, and you'll see that a lot in, in Amazon. Some of this is now publicly known that we kind of structure into very decentral decentralized autonomous teams that own their own destiny, not only in terms of what composition of the team should be, but also in terms of how, uh, what technologies they can pick and choose to continue to innovate so that they can be loosely coupled or 
loosely decoupled, whichever way you want to think of it, with, you know, with other teams and they don't end up slowing each other down. So the way we are, of course, structured are on key decisions. You can think of it, a decision of selection, what product should we carry, uh, that de uh, uh, decision itself has many nuances depending on the programs that it serves. Um, how much should we buy for any given product we sell? From whom should we buy? How should we distribute it in the network? Uh, the other side of the coin, what happens if we have too much? What do we do with it in real time? Uh, you can think of it this as the flow of goods from the source, the way to think about it, but typically we want to we like to think working backwards from the customers and there some of the key decisions are what promise should we offer to the customer. And when I say promise, when anybody wants or goes to shop at Amazon, they land on the product's detail page, there is a, a promise there, which is if the customer ordered in X, whatever that time window is, they will get the product in a particular time window. So we can work backwards from customers, that's the, uh, a decision we own, um, and many other decisions, you know, including but not limited to whatever I just said. So, so we have this gamut in terms of, you know, end-to-end uh, -end supply chain decisions. Um, obviously, there's a big question on why we do it. Well, some of you have seen this uh, Amazon flywheel on a, a you know, back from the old days uh, drawn on a napkin that uh, has some key elements uh, that fuel growth. And we uh, touch upon almost each of these elements and I'll quickly kind of go through some of them. Selection I talked about, um, we own selection for our core business, we own selection also for our really hyper fast delivery formats, you know, in certain cities we offer deliveries within the same day. The problem there, of course, morphs into a very different problem because you have limited shelf space. And yes, the brick and mortar stores have dealt with that problem for a long period of time. But we now have to deal with both where selection is a strategy. We must carry everything in our core business. We would like to as long as it makes sense and it's long-term free cash flow positive. Uh, but then in limited shelf formats, selection kind of morphs into a operational and a tactical kind of decision rather than just a policy or a strategy, if you may, where selection must at the same time be stable so that it can be executed to, but it should also be responsive to seasons, to events, St. Patrick's Day, Halloween, and all of this again has to be done in a highly automated manner with the least amount of human intervention. Uh, customer experience, I talked about we own promise. Um, and we, of course, what we select to buy, how much we buy, how we distribute it in the network, how we fulfill uh, customer orders directly impacts customer experience. Um, we'll briefly talk about, you know, the same systems or similar systems that we have for our uh, retail business where we buy and store inventory versus, uh, you know, the seller's business where we make recommendations to sellers. So we touch upon the seller side, uh, not just in terms of rec making recommendations, but also in terms of um, a lot of capacity management tools for them so that they continue to get the maximum efficiency they can get out of the uh, costs they are incurring in storing inventory in the network. And obviously all of this lowers, helps lower the cost structure, allows us to offer uh, lower prices to the customers. So, um, a slightly different way to think about this is that SCART is kind of like an orchestrator, uh, conductor if you may, of that orchestra, uh, of basically matching uh, supply to customer demand. Now, the, the thing to keep in mind is that we do this for billions of dollars of inventory 
for hundreds of billions of dollars of flow. Uh, we do this worldwide, and the heterogeneity in those countries in terms of what their needs and wants and in what part of the growth or the business life cycle they are in, um, compare India or Mexico or the US business, they all have very, uh, they are at, in a very different state of maturity and there are many nuances in each of these countries that the systems have to be built in a manner that they are extensible and uh, generalizable. Um, well, what can uh, the story of a journey be without one of these arrows of time kind of charts? But um, so I think um, the early phase of 19, you know, 95 to 2010 obviously was a phase where a lot of internal kind of businesses were um, running their own decisions, more or less, at least on the supply chain, on the inventory management side of things. You can call them, they were rule-based, um, potentially spreadsheet-based. The business by the time it was 2010, I think, um, was already a $40 billion revenue business, if I'm not wrong. So I don't think at that time it's fair to say things were in a spreadsheet mode, but you can imagine that when humans have to deal with that scale, um, the, I think the illusion of control kicks in, uh, shortcuts kick in, so I think potentially um, there was a maybe focus more on here are the top products, you can cut and dice them in various ways, let's make sure that works fine you're still dealing with millions of uh, products that we were selling. So the problem was already uh, by 2010 beyond anybody's you know, uh, ability, physical ability to go and say, I want to buy 26 units of this book and 23 units of this DVD. That was already beyond, uh, you know, the scale was beyond that ability. And uh, the human brain uh, is not, uh, probably experts here in the room more than I know, but it's not designed to deal with complex nonlinear optimization where economics, you know, kind of kick in. And so uh, when humans deal with that, they deal with, you can call them proxies, basically. I cannot actually optimize the actual problem, but I can maximize or minimize a proxy. A proxy could be, well, I want to give the best service level to the customers. And even that, I think, to do in a mathematically rigorous manner uh, becomes tricky. Um, I mean, you can, you can try to basically, and you deal with multiple proxies, so it kind of leads to this multi-objective thing. I want highest service level, I want uh, highest inventory turnover, so best efficiency, and kind of they, they can, and in many cases, they contradict each other. And so uh, you can think of that phase as a phase of a bit of a tribal knowledge kind of phase where every business had their own way of doing with it. And then 2011 uh, onwards, a few years there, uh, we kind of um, started, you can say, codifying this. We brought kind of this algorithmic-based uh, decision-making, uh, starting to remove almost dogmatically uh, any form of human intervention in the output or in the computation. Uh, we were okay with, with humans auditing the input. So the input and output, as an example, would be what is the product forecast? And the product forecast, you know, maybe humans can have better knowledge about it and they can provide an input and we'll take it, but we won't uh, accept uh, the output being overridden. Um, and of course, we started bringing in, we've always been about long-term thinking, so the, the view had to be about bringing long-term economics. 
not just transactional economics, not just how much money we make on a particular product, but what does it mean you know, in terms of carrying that product in our portfolio? What does it mean from a customer satisfaction over a long period of time? You know? So bringing all of that into, and, and I think it kind of naturally kind of evolved into this you know, phase two where it, with high levels of automation, the business outcome accountability started moving to, to us rather than to the businesses themselves, at least the decisions uh, that we were responsible for. And so that kind of led into the, the scaling of this automation to, um, to worldwide, to new countries that would start. The desire ended up becoming that we want to be highly automated in this decision making on day one rather than year two or year three. And then as it turns out in our world, we are never done. Phase three ended up, in some sense, as I said, it's an ongoing thing where new challenges, new complexities, faster deliveries, um, they, um, they are requiring us to continue to innovate at a pretty fast scale. So I'm going to go quickly into some of these you know, decisions, if you may, or some of these building blocks. I mean, forecasting. I mean, I, I think the previous remarks, there was a dedicated talk on this. I'm not the expert on forecasting, but um, you can imagine the, the, the challenge in forecasting in our world. Of course, the scale. We are talking about hundreds of millions of uh, products. Um, the demand for the product can be highly non-stationary. Um, demand can be very seasonal. Uh, you can imagine that a big chunk of the products we sell you know, wild guess, 80, 90% of the products have very little sales data, so the data set is quite sparse. Um, and for us to do true justice to automated, you know, algorithmic, you know, decision making based on, you know, economics and optimizing that, it has to recognize that forecasts are probability distribution function. So the, the output has to be something that recognizes that uncertainty. Um, and so one of the transformations that happened earlier on, and Salal will talk about, you know, there are of course many more advancements to this done later, was to obviously move, you know, from traditional classic kind of forecasting methods, you know, traditional time series methods to uh, bringing you know machine learning into it, um, an example you know being mentioned here that allows us to allowed us to deal with the sparsity was the sparse quantile random forest. So, um, and as I said, it's a lot more innovation that continues to happen in this area. Um, the the one of the core kind of decisions in terms of well, okay, how much should I buy for a product? How much inventory should I carry? Now this is, in some sense, people might say a textbook problem, often known in the you know, operations research literature as a news vendor problem, where you have um, costs of overstock, costs of understock. The, the classic kind of solution turns out to be a closed form solution where you can operate at a you know, critical kind of the, the solution is a critical fractile, which is pick a quantile on that distribution, and that is the uh, number of units you should buy. I mean, this problem is a highly stylized problem uh, compared to the real world problem that we have. Now, we, we have actual lead times for products that are stochastic, in addition to demand being stochastic. Um, we have salvage value of remaining inventory, which in of itself is a nonlinear function of how many units you have. If I buy and I make a poor decision and I'm sitting on 10 units of something over stock, the, the money I get on those 10 units is going to be a lot different than a decision for the same product where I'm sitting on 10,000 units of overstock. So the salvage value or the recovery value is not linear. Most of the literature you know, talks about that. 
And so we had to invent ways of dealing with that nonlinearity through. And the problem is a multi-decision problem. It's not a problem like a stylist news vendor problem. You make a decision, next day is a clean start. The decisions we make today have ramifications and implications on the decisions we we'll make in whatever tomorrow or the next cycle or the next planning cycle, if you may, which can be days or weeks in our world. Um, and this whole point of loss of goodwill or what is this cost of when you don't have enough? Uh, we did not want it to be debatable. We did not want it to be a judgment of someone. We did not want it to be somebody who could just arbitrarily claim that their business carries a much higher cost than someone else. And so that had to be quantified. And you know, almost each of these bullet points here in of itself, there's a ton of uh, research and development and actual implementation in our work. Uh, placement, what do you do? We have a large scale, what do you do in terms of distributing inventory? That had to be formulated as a, as a mathematical optimization problem with minimizing, with the objective of minimizing outbound shipping costs. Uh, obviously subject to some flow constraints, if you may, you can't uh, ship more than the number of units you have in a node, et cetera, et cetera. A pretty large scale, uh, uh, and then considerations on capacity, considerations, um, uh, several other, uh, this is of course an oversimplification of what the, the actual implementation is. The challenge, one thing to kind of take away is that as products arrive in our buildings, in our cross docks where we distribute, this program has to run order of magnitude a second or less. That decision has to be made from the point of receipt to the point that the label has to be applied on it as to where it goes, we have less than a second to make this decision. Um, fulfillment, which is as customers' orders come in, which particular node or a fulfillment center should they be assigned in real time? Um, Order of magnitude, millions of orders. This is a NP hard problem. Um, many other considerations in terms of um, what's the opportunity cost for, for this inventory, meaning if I use this inventory, um, will I regret not holding on to this because the next order I get that I may not have yet received may have a value, a higher value in terms of customer satisfaction, et cetera, et cetera, that I would, should have actually not used this inventory. So there's all, all this complexity. Um, and all of this had to be done in a way that you can reevaluate some of your shipment plans until the point you actually have to ship it so that you can maximize the information acquisition before you have to deli deliver the, or whatever service level targets you have at which you have to ship the product. You don't want to make a decision and live with it. Ideally, you would like to have the ability to go back to it uh, unless you're going to mi miss the customer promise. So very large scale integer programming problem. And I think the list can go on and on. I mean, as I said, uh, what do we do with the inventory we, we have? I mean, we can do several things with it depending on the business. We can return it to the vendor. We can put it on a markdown. When should the markdown stop? When should it actually now realize that we need to liquidate this stuff? We need to clear the space. How can that be capacity aware dynamically, particularly in peak periods when storage capacity becomes, gets, you know, holds a premium? You would want these systems to automatically increase their uh, you know, mark, markdown cadence, if you may. All of these, you know, um, and none of this, by the way, could be done and accomplished without real large scale experimentation. And by that, I mean in production, uh, randomized control trials, which we kind of build capabilities internally in a highly, you know, mathematically rigorous manner to do it. 
uh, where complex algorithmic changes, they go through you know, live experimentation where you have a control group and a treatment group. You can look at every possible metric uh, and comparing the two approaches. You know. And of course, in many cases, doing this with uh, large-scale discrete event simulation systems before you would go into, or in some cases before you would go into uh, in-production experimentation. Now, phase two, none of this could have happened. Uh, recall phase two was now going from simply making a decision uh, and in that kind of point where automation levels have reached you know, high 90% and this is you know, automation here, meaning each of the decisions that I talked about, there is no human involvement in the output of it or questioning or the overriding the output of it. Um, once you get to that stage, um, uh, obviously the earning of trust with the stakeholders, people who also have direct accountability and ownership as much as we do, uh, how do you build trust with them? Um, and that kind of led to a lot of kind of change in the in the mindset. I think in, the, in phase one, you could say that we were kind of almost, the belief was that we had to do this. These systems would do the right thing because the gap at that time was the not having any economics-based optim optimization kind of into the decision making. Once you get into phase two, the approach kind of starts morphing into um, becoming a lot more humble and realizing that the systems are never perfect. Uh, and so accepting that uh, one must continue to look at defects. Uh, we ended up changing the organizational structure where teams, you know, an organization got formed simply to continue to poke holes, continue to find defects, rather than our stakeholders and our own internal customers finding them, we wanted to find that ourselves. And we don't think of this as a QA function, but more like a, a business audit. Uh, you can think of it as a model independent, system independent way of looking at the outputs, inputs, and continuing to uh, look and improve and correct those defects. Um, and of course, this phase, as I said, was turned into running you know, the business with or through technology. And as I said, as I alluded to in the earlier slide, it kind of required a bit of metamorphosis. It required us to be um, skeptical and have some measured paranoia about, uh, and, and the, the approach to approach had to change from the system is doing what it is designed to do was the previous paradigm to the approach that um, I think there's that famous quote, you know, that all, all models are wrong and some are useful, maybe that kind of thinking, that the systems are, um, of course, subject to a bunch of other things, you know, in terms of inputs being bad, or obviously garbage in, garbage out being the classic one, but, but that philosophy where continue to believe that they are imperfect, continue to look for uh, defects, um, own the final outcomes. Obviously, in the breadth that I've talked about, all the way, various systems, literally connecting the dots across those systems itself becomes uh, much harder. You know? um, and then, of course, you don't want your analysis to start slowing things down. So this whole balance between bias for action and deep dive or bias for action and insisting on higher standards, there is always this kind of a, a challenge to kind of deal with uh, these things that can sometimes contradict each other. Um, and then, of course, um, explaining the outcomes is part of this you know, I think one of my professors back in the days used to say that uh, no rational entity would make bad decisions. It's the outcomes that are bad, decisions are not bad. And so, you know, uh, we had to constantly kind of remind ourselves of business outcome accountability. 
With this, I'm going to hand it over to Salal, who's going to walk you through the, the last but never the least phase in our journey. Thanks, Deepak. Can everybody hear me? Ah, good. Okay. Gr great. Well, thanks, Deepak. By the end of phase two in 2017, around 2017 or 18, we were running one of the largest decision-making systems, uh, algorithmic decision-making systems for supply chains in the world. Highly decentralized, highly optimized, and allowing us to scale to new geographies within um, in weeks instead of years or months. So um, that would have been, if I had been at another company, that might have been the crowning achievement of my lifetime, but um, it turns out that that en ended up being our starting line and not our finish line. So a change was not waiting for us, so, um, and this time there were no textbook solutions. But let me first uh, start with the forces that were around, that, that were forcing us to change. So our business in around 2018 or 19 was growing rapidly. Customer expectations were rising. They were expecting that they would be able to get selection products from anywhere in the world at their doorstep. A lot of our sellers were beginning to sell across, uh, across countries, across boundaries to other, um, uh, other customers. And in addition to that, at the same time, the customers were also expecting that if they needed something fast, it would be delivered at their doorstep in a day or less. So um, it, it was leading to the rise of a number of programs such as Prime Now, Ultra Fast Grocery, and so on and so forth. And to support this network, um, this, this growth, the network complexity was increasing exponentially. We, were, we had a number of layers of FCs of different types coming in other facilities, sort centers, distribution centers, delivery stations for routing inventory, both into to our network and from out, out of our network. So this is, let me give, show you some pictures here. So this is a picture of um, uh, some of our facilities that were around in 2019. Uh, you don't have to um, really pay attention to this. The colors um, just mean that there are different types of facilities. You really can't read the numbers, so don't pay too much attention to it. The point of this slide is that even in 2019, we had enough um, in terms of our infrastructure around that we could ship things across the globe at will. And this second picture is a snapshot of a sample of flows that we were already seeing around 2018 and 19. And again, the details of this figure are not important. What's important is that we were seeing global flows, we were seeing cross-regional flows that were already happening. And at the same time, uh, we were globalizing. We were being forced to localize. In 2019, Amazon uh, rolled out its prime benefit and made it faster. It was a step change in customer expectations. Prime benefit became one day instead of two day free delivery. And this caused a massive shift in our need to put inventory closer to the customers. To launch prime one day promise in 2019, we pro probably bought around a billion dollars of inventory um, to scale up. And another example of localization. So at the same time, uh, businesses such as Prime Now were growing globally. And these were requiring us to deliver products to customers within two hours. And so uh, consequently, we had to decide what products these would be because you can't deliver tens of millions of products to customers within two hours. Let me uh, give you a quick snapshot of the increase in complexity that was happening while the business was expanding. This figure shows our network structure for the United States as it evolved from 2010 to 2019. Within a decade, we moved from what was a small east to west backbone network to a heavily connected east to west, north to south network. Uh, this picture, you, I mean, you have to look at it for a while to, to see the pattern, but but I'll move on and show you another, another picture of the same network and the same evolution, which is a little more, a bit uh, visually clearer. So in this picture, we are again showing the uh, evolution of the US network from 2010 to 2019, but we have sort of laid out the facilities in layers. At the top level, you have this, these things called crosstalks, which are routing inventory from our suppliers to our FCs. The middle two layers are actually the FCs which serve prime, uh, the bulk of our customers, prime demand. And the bottom layer are facilities such as Prime Now FCs, Grocery FCs, which are much closer to the customers. So what you can see here is how each layer 
has been growing, um, tripling or quadrupling in the last decade. And you can also see a proliferation of the arcs as they are going through um, uh, between the layers. So we, uh, by, by 2018, 19, we realized that even though we were running a very automated business, our technology needed to address several uh, challenges. We had to manage inventory for both global and local demand, ensure faster delivery, manage the selection, manage sellers' in, uh, inventory in the same network, and implement it at scale across all geographies. So I'm going to share, give you a glimpse of some of the new technologies that we built. And remember, this is all being done while we are actually running a business, right? So we have to build new technologies. I'll talk about neural networks for forecasting, something we call multi-echelon inventory planning. I'll explain what that is. Optimizing store selection, um, designing systems for FPA sellers, and, and a few more examples. So for, from forecasting, so from what we had, sparse quantile random forests, uh, around 2016, we started experimenting with feed-forward neural networks. These models would allow us to predict the demand distribution for any products, hundreds of millions of products. Any product, you give me a time period in the future, any time within the next year, it will give you a full demand distribution, which is good, except the fact that it required a lot of manual feature engineering and months of uh, manual tuning for new models and scaling them across geographies. So we ended up developing new uh, uh, architectures based on convolutional neural networks, which would directly go to the demand and with automated feature engineering. And they'd directly access demand, allowing us to borrow statistical strengths from different time series. So the, for instance, the, 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 these new networks could take demand from demand patterns from long history products and use them to, to predict demand for new products. And as our experience with the uh, convolutional networks has grown, we have recently turned our attention to, literally turned our attention to attention-based neural networks. But um, yeah, and as, I, as Deepak said, we are both not experts in forecasting, but we are happy to answer any questions you may have. Let me move on to another one of our major challenges. Uh, this is all, remember, phase two. We are running our automated business, and we are, we are having to build new solutions. So it's called multi-echelon inventory optimization. So in literature, a multi-echelon supply chain is very much like the picture you see here. Layers of facilities supplying each other with massive connections between them, and um, with some facilities supplying downstream facilities. And like I showed earlier, our network was becoming multi-echelon and growing in complexity. And so we had to manage and decide how much of each product to store in each facility at each layer, tens of millions of products and hundreds of facilities, and this time, we did not have a textbook solution. And so we could potentially look at literature for inspiration, but we really had to invent our own. And that's because the system that we wanted or needed to build was obviously complex, very large scale, tens of millions, as I said, products and hundreds of FCs. Half of the inventory in this network is not in our control. It's FBA sellers. It has constrained capacity, both flow and storage at every, in every facility and dynam dynamic order fulfillment, right? There is a dynamic system running at order fulfillment time that's deciding how to assign demand to each FC. That complicates things enormously in terms of modeling and system building. And the same supply could be used to, to uh, satisfy demand for multiple delivery speeds. So, and we not only had to come up with a technical solution, we had to scale it up while, uh, you know, not basically harming the, what we were already doing. So first, a couple of uh, quick comments on the technical part. So we developed a framework which we call multi-echelon uh, planning V2, or MEP V2 for short. It's a decentralized system for buying, placing, and replenishing inventory in a network which is capacity constrained and has dynamic fulfillment. And at a high level, what this framework does is it takes a big problem, millions of ASINs, throw them all in, all the constraints, et cetera, put everything in, and try to optimize that problem. It's a, it's a very hard, non-convex, uh, 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 it's hard in mul multiple ways. But you solve that problem, and then you take the information from that problem and communicate it to uh, models that are making product by product, a or what we call ASINs, ASIN by ASIN decision. And the kind of information you communicate are basically um, uh, the opportunity costs of capacity for resources, and the target inventory levels and the cost of deviations from those target inventory levels for each product in each facility, allowing you to communicate not just basically what the cost of capacity uh, is, but also the mix of products within, within that system. 
So that's on the technical part. The technical part could be a full talk, but we are, we are not going to talk about it. I, let me uh, say a few things on the organizational part, right? This was by the framework that we had, I talked about was by no means an obvious choice. There were a number of choices on the table, opposing points of view, and a lot of debates. And so we had to iterate, fail, iterate, fail, iterate, fail many times. And the outcomes during those years of iteration were always ambiguous. So there was not like, oh, yes, we, we just hit on gold. That, that didn't happen. We always had, or over, over a course of a few years, we had to use a lot of judgment and conviction to stay the course. We, over 2018 to 2020, we ran like four uh, randomized control trials. Uh, we, we call them labs, so I'll, I'll, I'll call them labs. We ran like four labs, each lab three to four months long. Every one of them failed. <laughs> Every one of them caused multiple reviews, figuring out what, what is going on. It was only at, in 2020 that we were finally able to see in a lab the big difference that the system was making, that we finally rolled out the solution. So, so uh, let me go on to another example, um, for which we, uh, a problem for which we needed to develop new technology. So uh, with hyperfast speeds, we had prime now, sub-same day delivery, grocery, ultra-fast grocery, and all of these are what we call shelf-limited formats, where you can't possibly offer these tens of millions of products um, for fast delivery. So you have to figure out what subset of products you're going to pick from a universe which itself is millions. And we, on top of that, uh, we, we also know that for things like grocery customers uh, tend to shop in um, for baskets of products. So, this is a hard problem because the optimal assortment de should depend on substitutability between products. If you don't find one yogurt, you might buy another. Complementarity between products. If you're looking for milk, you might also be looking for bread. And basket abandonment, right? If a customer is looking to buy orange and apples and, and bananas and they don't find bananas, she or may just go to another store and just buy everything. And like multi-echelon inventory optimization, this time too, we had to invent our own framework and solution for optimization because the problem is too complex. And let me give you an idea of the technical complexity here and where we had to bring in machine learning, economics, and optimization in a single framework to solve the problem. Uh, this model, by the way, is being used to, to manage the selection for our sub-same day delivery. So we have broke the problem into components. First, we had to figure out using machine learning which products customers considered substitutable. Uh, like we had to use natural language processing um, uh, and a number of other things use, using query, click, and purchase data to figure out, to classify products into distinct subgroups. And the idea is all products within a group are substitutable with each other and those outside are less so. Second, we had to figure out what is the probability that a customer who's coming in will buy one of the products in each one of these substitutable groups. And um, this probability, crucially, the probability of buying a product is not just dependent on the product, it depends on the entire selection that you choose to offer in that subgroup. And so the underlying model is based on choice theory, which comes from economics and a bunch of ML, which is uh, used to estimate what is the likelihood that the customer will even view uh, such an item. The, th the third component we had was to uh, figure out what the cross-category complementarity model should be. What is the likelihood that somebody looking for bread will also be, like if they have conditioned on the fact they have bought bread, that they would be looking for milk. And finally, we had to put it all together in an optimization that included basket amendment. So at the end of the day, the problem became hard, non-convex, and large number of constraints, and we ended up doing a bunch of tricks to try and solve it um, the best we could. So I've so far talked about like building these new technologies, about forecasting neural networks um, and multi-echelon inventory optimization, selection optimization. Let me talk now a bit about what we had to do for our FBA sellers. FBA is a very key part of our business. It gives hundreds of thousands of sellers all across the world an ability to build their business. And many, or most of them are small and medium-sized sellers. Um, and they are also very diverse, from sellers who are running multi-million dollar businesses to sellers who are selling only one product, sellers that are selling in-country, sellers that are selling across country. Some use RFCs to fulfill demand, some fulfill demand from their facilities, some use a hybrid. And sellers have complete autonomy on what products they choose to sell, how much they send to us, what prices to charge, and so on. 
which raises a number of operational uh, problems for us. Unlike inventory that we buy from our vendors, um, we just don't have information on what they are going to choose to send us. And some of these problems, for instance, are short and long-term capacity management. How much labor should we hire? How many FCs should we build? And other problems are more like, how do we manage the curse of the commons, right? Where a small number of products or a small number of sellers might be clogging the network and making it harder for, for other sellers to inbound at peak. So to solve some of these problems, uh, we invented new metrics and technologies. Um, around 2018, we rolled out something what we call the inventory performance index. It's like a credit card score from zero to 1,000 that tells sellers how efficiently they're man managing their own inventory. And the development of such a metric was a first because we had to find a way to take this diverse population of sellers and diverse population of products and put them on a common measure. And in 2018, we also rolled out what we call the storage management system to allocate capacity to a very small subset of the sellers uh, that, that had the least efficient inventory so that we could allocate capacity to them so that the remainder of the, the, the sellers could inbound freely at bulk. And we call it the storage management system. And this was also done in 2018, launched in 2018. In 2019, we developed new systems for recommending replenishment quantities to sellers. So um, this was an, another hard problem because we just don't have the information that sellers have. They know their costs, they know their operational parameters, we don't. But we were still able to use uh, robust optimization to try and limit the downside risk to sellers from following our recommendations. And in 21, 22, we, are, we have just rolled out market-based mechanisms to allocate. If we ha happen to have uh, additional capacity, we can allocate that to the sellers. The problem with the previous storage management system was that uh, if sellers wanted more capacity, they had to request it, and we had to have manual systems, and we had no way of knowing if they are going to make use of it or not. With this new system, we have found a way to allocate any excess capacity we may have to sellers that will make the best use of it. So let me come to one final example of a technology that we built um, um, in phase three. So when you have machines making almost all decisions, um, how do you explain why things happened the way they did? So as our scale had grown, we had developed uh, or invested in orgs, which were hundreds of people fielding questions from stakeholders. And why have my in-stock rates changed? Why do I have more inventory? Each such question requires manual deep dives, hundreds of person hours to answer. And the causal uh, systems that we have, like randomized control trials, are not very helpful in answering these questions. So we realized we needed new methods based on observational data uh, for causal analysis. So we invested um, in graphical causal models to try and see how we could explain the, the outcomes in terms of uh, very complex algorithmic decisions that were being taken. And, and we found some uh, good nuggets in there. The, and this work is continuing, and we are continuing to invest in it. Um, uh, for the future. So the, I, I, we obviously don't have time to talk about everything that is going on, but let me just uh, say that the journey is not over. The range of problems uh, requiring disruptive technology solutions is not exhaustive. And so I haven't even mentioned uh, a number of very important initiatives, large-scale initiatives that are going on, one of which is redesigning our systems for first-party tra transportation a very large, very complex, multi-year initiative that cuts across a number of operations teams. And its purpose is to make sure that our first party logistics systems that are transportation systems that we own, are we optimally utilizing them? And it's a very big redesign of our, our systems. We are also redesigning our systems network to make it easier for sellers to inbound. We are adding more layers to our network and we are redesigning our automated systems to make sure that the inventory is orchestrated between them uh, in a seamless manner. We are build, building multi-channel inventory disposition uh, methods, uh, systems for both ourselves as well as our sellers. When you have inventory, excess inventory, how do you dispose of it in the best possible way using multiple marketing channels and you coordinate between them because they are all linked together? And we haven't talked about sustainability, the work we are doing. Um, in, in support of Amazon's net zero carbon goals. So um, I'll end with that. So the phase three innovation. So the, the message you should take away from that is that we are not a static organization. We, um, 
are continuing to innovate, and some of those innovations are really groundbreaking. And so let me um, just share in this last slide some of the lessons we have learned on driving innovation at Amazon scale and still behave like a startup. And, and that's a, a, a pretty key thing. And so um, for, here are some principles. Uh, they may not be universal principles, but I be, we believe that they have worked and still work for us. And they have al allowed us to really you know, um, stay, stay very, very nimble. And the first two of these are also actually in Andy Jassy's 2021 letter to the shareholders. Hire the right builders. We um, focus obsessively on hiring builders. Builders are people who like to invent, um, figure out what doesn't work, and reinvent the customer experience. And we want people who like to experiment and who realize that launch is the starting line and not the finish line. The second one is give, give teams, a, like let the teams control their own destiny. And it's hard for teams to drive improvements if they are focused on too many things. Single-threaded teams tend to have, uh, they understand their customers, they know how to iterate, and they know how to improve their customers' experiences. Number three is that we really put a premium on taking risk. Uh, it is very hard for teams to find the time to invest in new ideas if they are, because there will always be resource contention. But we constantly remind ourselves, as well as our teams, that we need to take risks. And number four is kind of interesting because this is a lesson that I think I certainly have learned, that if you're going to drive big change, disruptive change, uh, chances are much uh, more that it'll fail if it's only bottoms up or tops down. So if it stops down, by the time you get to the frontline teams, they don't even understand why they're do doing it. They don't have any missionary zeal. And so it's just like, oh, uh, I was ordered to do this. If it's bottoms up, I have seen more often than enough that you, know, you get to the top and it's not even aligned with the strategic priority. So you have to somehow figure out how, to, at the beginning, how to push from both ends and make sure that that bridge is maintained so that the missionary zeal is there, but there is also strategic guidance. And uh, five, trust is key, trust is premium. If you, you cannot scale these systems, we are not in a world where uh, machine, it's not the matrix, right? People have skepticism of machines, so it, uh, stakeholder trust is key. And maintaining that trust is, is very important for you to scale. And finally, we always take the long-term view it has always worked for us, and um, it's not easy. It's not something that is predestined and comes from data. Data is always unambiguous, so you need a lot of conviction and judgment to stay the course. But it has yielded spectacular benefits for us, and we believe for our customers. Um, with that, we have seven minutes left. I thank you for listening. I'll invite Deepak back to the stage, and I invite you to ask any questions. There are two microphones, one here and one here. If you have any questions, we'll be happy to take them. Uh, thank you for the talk. It's really, really interesting. Um, just touching upon Amazon's sustainability targets, particularly looking at like scope three and how that has such broad impact across your entire supply chain. How, how does that really affect the modeling that you're doing for with Scott? Um, and you know, is it simply just adding a, another constraint to the model, or is it how, how do you even break down such a large problem? That, that's a great question. So it's a great question, and by the way, it's not a settled uh, question right now. So the, uh, I'll share with you um, uh, our thinking. So, at, so right now, Scott controls a lot of these decisions, and so it has a huge influence on the volumes that are going around. But the actual resources that, um, that are direct emitters of carbon, like the number of trucks, types of trucks, et cetera, the, those are controlled by other teams. So what we are doing is we, are, uh, we have experiments in the works, so we have developed a mental model for what we are going to do, and we have recognized exactly what you're saying is like, I can redirect volume, but I need to coordinate with the team that's actually planning to truck to say, I'm going to send you this much volume, don't change the truck, run that experiment on alternatives and see how much, uh, so because the trade-off we have is, I can reduce carbons uh, all I want, but what will it do to my customer experience metrics, right? And so we are actually in the process of running these ex a couple of experiments this year to coordinate between what Scott does. So we think we are going to reduce carbon. We are going to ask them, do X, Y, Z, and then we are going to measure the effects. But yeah, that's, uh, that's how we are. We are not going to um, 
It may come through costs, it may come through constraints, but one way or another, based on our understanding of whether we are reducing carbon, we are going to change the volumes. Sure. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, uh, I would like to know more about the, your approach in forecasting the inventory uh, with the new products where you do not have as much data as you know, ongoing product are selling for a long time. So I'm curious about your approach on do the forecasting and planning for the new products. Thank you. So <laughs> that, is, that is a good question. So uh, I am not, I can't go at, uh, deep at an arbitrary level in forecasting. So my understanding is still that we are using the same architecture. We are not doing anything special. For, for new products, right? So it, it was convolutional neural networks. They were tuned a little bit to forecast so that you could look at like products and lift, lift some properties for how their history evolved early on in their uh, pattern. But it is all a, the same architecture. So one of the keys to automation is, or at least we try to, is don't have uh, different types of solutions for different types of products. And so have a uniform architecture that you can apply to all sorts of things. So we still use the same, uh, that's one reason why we have, uh, we move to these attention-based neural networks. So there you can actually ask, tell, tell um, you know, the, the system to pay attention to new products a little bit more, weight them more heavily. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, I would like to thank you for the talk. Also, I had a question on the interaction between the models and the actual teams that are on the business executing, you said that this required organizational changes and the team developing move from system owners to outcome or, or owners, but they're still buyers, they're still SNOP teams making decisions on the floor every day. How do those interactions work with the models and the decisions that you I'll, make I'll let every Deepak day? talk about it. Deepak is a veteran. Um, <clears throat> Well, in some cases, those uh, functions over a period of time did get eliminated. So, so uh, I think there were never, to my knowledge, in my 11 years in Amazon, there were no, never buyers in Amazon in the typical supply chain sense. But the act of buying was being performed by a bunch of teams. They don't perform that act anymore, but they, they have a free will in auditing. Um, and we have ourselves instituted processes and mechanisms and teams for that audit. So we, we've created that team such that they can be seen as an extension of those teams in our organization because they understand the systems much better than say someone who's X degrees uh, you know, separated. And so I think this is a bit of a self kind of a disciplining that we have to do which I had talked about, that we cannot just assume that the systems are perfect or even close to. I think we have to live with that humility that um, there are defects at our scale. Uh, the other interesting thing is that we've almost uh, become very uh, organized around what we call anecdotes, which is basically uh, you know, you, you take a customer, uh, put a customer kind of lens and find what are perceived defects and then you go all the way down five wise, you know, uh, was it actually a defect, was it not a defect? And it ends up creating this culture where we, we go find many such defects, not just related to the problem we started with, but a bunch of other kind of things we find on our way. Um, so I think it's a, there isn't a single answer to it. Uh, there's also, by the way, it's not just the business teams. There are system to system teams. Their interaction has also become a lot more interesting for the lack of a better word, because while we, we aspire, would like to think that we are optimizing one objective function, the, the way it gets implemented is a transformation of that that is a lot relevant for that team. So you can think of it that the team that is doing uh, placement, it optimizes for our shipping costs. The team that's doing buying, it optimizes for something else. But that is their first order effect, and that's the kind of approximation we sometimes kind of live in. Sometimes when they can, they can make it look like they're going in opposite directions, and that leads to a lot of interesting debates and deep dives. 
So uh, it looks like our organizers, we are, have run out of time. Yeah. Uh, I'm, we are happy to talk outside if you have a question. Yeah. Uh, I see. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you. You've been a great audience. Thanks.